we're going to pick up in our book where we left off. We left off with a camp meeting having taken place, harvesting gathering having taken place after camp meeting, and that's where we stopped. And Elder Andreasen is at the Minnesota Conference, leading out at the conference. And we pick up on page 111 in Without Fear or Favor, the biography of M.L. Andreessen. The Minnesota Conference was noted for its strong laity. In fact, some of the laymen on the conference committee made it hard for any conference president who did not favor their part of the field or make sure that the conference academy was given due consideration. They made it hard on him when that happened. Some presidents of the conference had lasted only a couple of years, but M.L. went on year after year. Seven times he had to inspire the members to go out and finish in gathering. Some leaders were concerned that if they tried all their ideas for getting the goal in one year, they would have no new ones to inspire the people the next year. But M.L. was not worried. His mind was always searching out new approaches. One year, he thought of issuing a badge to each member registering at camp meeting. Wearing his name and address, the member felt as if he were attending a general conference session or a professional convention, but it also helped M.L. to call each member by his or her name. A typical method M.L. used to secure the cooperation of the laymen was to invite as many of them as could to stay after camp meeting and help break camp um, so the ministers could get at their regular work more promptly. Quote, we were surely blessed with good weather for camp meeting this year and also for taking down the camp. Most of the tents were down and in the warehouse by Monday evening and the grounds were completely cleared by Wednesday afternoon. The assistance of the lay brethren who stayed after camp meeting and helped in this work was much appreciated. End quote. When Michigan was carrying on its camp meeting on the racetrack, of a fairground, Minnesota had already put up a permanent building on its campground. There were members who objected, but M.L. had studied the testimonies on the subject and had consulted with general conference and union men, and the decision was reached that a permanent site should be developed. According to the per capita mission offering report sent out from the General Conference for the first quarter of 1925, Minnesota was one of the poorest conferences in North America. The next year it did better, raising nearly 40 cents a week per member, two-thirds of the 60 cent a week goal. Quote, some can do a little more, and I believe there are enough who can do a little more to raise the whole goal, the last third. One third more to make up the whole three thirds. Who will help? Who will add to this offering? It can be done. Let us do it, and let us start early this year, right now. Minnesota will raise the last third, end quote. M.L. invented Square Up Day, quote, In this campaign, dollars mean souls. Work, pray, then work some more. The end of the year must see every church square on its 60 cents a week goal. Let all the workers do their part. Let all the officers get under the responsibility. Let the women rally to the work. Let us all pull together, and then Minnesota will not come behind. End quote. 
no matter what special activity was on the calendar, M.L. had at least a sentence to help it on its way. For example, the one thing just now is the big week. Or, the signs of the Times subscription campaign begins next Sabbath. Let us all boost it. Remember, more signs, more souls. Or, subscribe for the review and keep up with the message. Another, may the love of Christ who gave all for us constrain us to make a liberal gift for him next Sabbath in the 13th, 13th Sabbath offering. The more isolated members of the flock were not forgotten. One year, ML sent them all camp meeting programs so that, quote, all who for some reason can't come to the camp meeting can unite with us in seeking the Lord. The daily program will enable you to join heartily with us at the same time as the meetings are being held on the campground. End quote. Side roads were not s snowplowed in the late 1920s, so for weeks many church members were snowbound. Quote, but these are not deprived of the blessings of the home Sabbath school, M.L. wrote. Even if there is only one person, he can belong to the home department. Let him set aside a little time for the review and study of the lesson. Let him have prayer audibly or silently. Let him put aside his offering to be handed in at the first opportunity. And let him keep faithful record. The enjoyment of the Lord's presence and blessing does not necessarily depend upon numbers or the presence of a minister. He has promised to be with us even unto the end, and no matter how isolated we may be. End quote. Radio sets were just making their way into Minnesota homes. In March of 1929, three years after H.M.S. Richards made his first broadcast, M.L. began an eight-week experiment in broadcasting on Sabbath afternoons, especially for the benefit of our isolated believers, as well as for smaller companies who do not have a pastor. It is planned for Elder Andreasen to deliver the sermon at the afternoon radio service next Sabbath. Many have written, this quote says, about neighbors who have listened to these services and others have been invited to the home of a neighbor to hear over their receiving set. Be sure to follow up such an interest as tact as you can, and let us hope that much good may be accomplished in this way. At three o'clock sharp, this same year also saw Minnesota's first camp meeting for youth, directed by Frank Yost. That was three years after Mi Michigan had pioneered with the, f with the first Seventh-day Adventist youth camp or junior camp, sorry, M.L. wrote, quote, There are many things to be taken into consideration in planning for a camp of this kind, and we want to make no avoidable mistakes. We firmly believe that this encampment will prove a great blessing to the young men who will avail themselves of this unusual privilege as the year 1929 drew to a close, M.L. suggested a personal inventory. Quote, Are we better able to meet the struggles and trials of the last days now than we were at the beginning of the year? Have we made any progress spiritually? Have any definite victories been gained in 1929, or are the defeats more numerous? 
Are we more faithful in Sabbath observance and private religious devotion than we were 12 months ago? At the end of the year, should we also take time to make up our financial records. Let these few remaining days of 1929 be a time of heart searching and examination, and with that desire to redeem the time and square up all things with God and man. At other times, the articles were pu purely devotional. Quote, for a child of God, no question is of greater importance than his own relation to the Godhead. As a child of God, does he exhibit the family likeness and the family traits that immediately identify him as being related to God? Ordinarily, children partake both of the physical and spiritual qualities of the parents. They may look like and act like father or mother, and they sometimes have small ways that are characteristic of the family. Apply this spiritually. We take it for granted that God is not irritable, impatient, unkind, or unlovely. He does not speak ill of any, does not treat his own family to exhibitions of temper, carefully concealed from others, he is unvaryingly kind and sympathetic and never gets cross or says unkind words. He is kind to those who are unkind, patient with those who are in an ugly mood, willing always to forgive and forget. He is all that we can conceive of as being worthwhile how much do we exhibit the family traits? It may be worthwhile to check up on ourselves. When others see us in a burst of temper, they are well aware of our shortcomings. Are we? We should be. Let us rather show forth the graces of him who has called us from darkness into his marvelous light. That's the end of that chapter, and we're moving into the next. And the next one starts with um, Andreas in speaking, or perhaps writing in his journal. And it's he says, As president of the Minnesota Conference, I was a member of the Board of Union College and met regularly with it. Union College was having trouble again, and it became necessary to find a new president. This was not easy. There was something not quite right with every candidate suggested. At last, having exhausted every other possibility, they came to my name. Would I accept the offer? I laughed. Just a few years previously, I had been given the gate <laughs> as a faculty member. Now I was being asked to serve as president. Days went by, and no headway was made. I should have left the room when they discussed me, but I couldn't stay away for days, so I remained. My presence did not deter them from speaking plainly. I enjoyed it all, for I knew I could never be elected and did not care much for what was said. But at last, the matter became serious. They could not find a suitable man. The majority was in favor of me, but there was a strong minority against me. The final argument was that the general conference would never permit me to serve, so it was decided that the general conference should be consulted. The answer was received that Professor C.W. Irwin, head of the education department, would come out. After a few days, he arrived at the campus. He was sent to tell the board that, oh dear, that I must not be elected. I sat in the room listening to his report, and he did well, not sparing. 
He convinced me that I was not the man, but the board elected me. And when next morning I received a wire from my wife agreeing uh, that I should accept it, I did. The situation at Union College was not good. Strange teachings had been brought in that affected both teachers and students. The president had renounced the faith and had influenced teachers and students to do the same. But chief Bible teacher had followed the president, excuse me, the chief Bible teacher had followed the president, but evidently did not know what he had done. He soon died, considering himself a good Adventist, but misjudged by his brethren. He was a good man and a Christian. Union College was in a bad way. It had lost the confidence of the field as a safe place to send young people. The first day of the next school year, we enrolled less than 200 students. We were heavily in debt. Every time the clock struck, we went $5 behind. And the outlook for the future was not good. To cap the climax, Union now had a president not approved by the general conference. Union was doomed. I was set. I was to set things straight, to be a reformer. It was a hard year for me. I had a position I did not deserve and was not fitted for. The faculty did well to adjust to me. Gradually, they began to talk to me. End of his portion. And now we go back to the author of the book. Although this is ML's evaluation of the situation, the expectations had not been all negative. This editorial appeared in the Central Union Outlook of August 4, 1931, with a picture of ML. <clears throat> and then the author quotes from the uh, Central Union Outlook. Quote, Professor Andreasen is an educator of long experience and a public speaker of unusual ability. His pleasing and affable disposition wins him friends everywhere. The editor of this paper congratulates the college on being able to secure a man of such strength and experience as its president. The youth who attend Union College under Professor Andreasen's administration will be inspired by his enthusiasm, his eagerness, his sincerity, and his Christian integrity, end quote. On December 1, ML's byline appeared in the Union paper under this article, quote, If any endeavor is to succeed, there must be a planning ahead. That is what we are do doing at Union College. We are planning for the second semester and also for the next year and years to come. While the master tarries, we must occupy. The students of Union College are now sending out hundreds of letters to prospective students, and we expect very definite results from this campaign. We need more students. A larger attendance would materially help in solving some of the problems we are now facing. We believe we will have that larger attendance. Our friends everywhere are telling us that they are back of the school and will support it to the utmost. We believe they will. The whole field is supporting us. The faculty is working hard. We are straining every nerve to make Union a bigger and better school next year. We believe we will succeed. We are trying to deserve your support. Plan for next year. But do not forget that there is an excellent chance to do a half year's work by enrolling for the second semester to, um, this year. End quote. The students' writing activities had been sparked 
by the chapel hour on the Monday before Thanksgiving. Gra grateful the year was off to such a good start, M. L. was nevertheless anxious for more young people to come share the blessings. He asked the students to put into a few words what Mother Union meant to them. One student after another shot to his feet to express his gratitude. Often several were standing at the same time, waiting for their chance to testify how Union had blessed their lives. M. L. nodded as each speaker took his turn. I appreciate the pleasant association with Christian teachers and students, or I am thankful for the helpful Christian spirit expressed in personal interest in each member of the school family, or how I thank God for my spiritual advancement since coming here. Another one said, I want to be true to the spirit of the pioneer workers who founded Union. And another, I know young people in the church at home who should have the privilege of being here. I want to invite them. M.L. summed up the students' sentiments. Quote, you ask what we can do to help our college increase its usefulness? It's very simple. Go and tell your friends what Union has done for you. Under the date of April 5, 1932, M.L. wrote on Progress at Union College. He said, We are, of course, hard hit by financial conditions. We are doing our best to economize and are meeting with some success. The teachers are, co are cooperating in every way. I wish to emphasize this point, for it is a real pleasure to work with such a group of men and women. We are trying to remain true to the faith once delivered to the saints. In a school where there are hundreds of students with active minds whose chief work is study, it would be strange if theological difficulties and problems should not arise. We must not take the attitude that students shall not think. That would be fatal. But as long as we are guided by the teachings of the Bible and the writings of the spirit of prophecy, we will not go far astray. With the experience of the past few years to serve as a warning, we should be very careful not to give the impression that we are afraid of having anyone think. That was one fear some had when I connected with the school. Orthodoxy is not dependent upon non-thinking. Seventh-day Adventist doctrines are eminently fitted for deep and thorough investigation. Clear thinking only makes truth shine brighter. We have had and are having some interesting studies, and I believe some good is being accomplished. Among these studies are Organization in the Spirit of Prophecy. ML recognized the Great Depression as an opportunity. He said, There is no time like the present to prepare for the future. There is very little work to be had and not much money to be earned anywhere. We would advise every young man and woman who can arrange to get a little money to go to school this year. Rates have been reduced, and every effort is being made to help students. We have never had a better faculty, and there is a determination on the part of all to cooperate and make this year a success. We do not know whether better times will ever come or not. But if they should, even for a little time, it would be worthwhile to have the preparation out of the way to be ready to do efficient work when times ease up a little. End quote. An unsigned article in the same issue announced, quote, 
At a recent meeting at, of the Union College Board, it was decided that President Andreessen, in addition to his work as president, assume the responsibilities of the head of the Bible department. This is made possible by a reorganization in the administrative work of the college, whereby many of the duties formally carried by the president will be carried out by the executive dean, end quote. The dean tells of their experience in working out this arrangement, quote. When President Andreessen asked me to be the dean, it wasn't clear what that meant. <laughs> so we went to the University of Chicago to find out what other people thought. It turned out that as we enumerated various responsibilities, virtually all of them were considered as responsibilities of the dean and not the president. ML asked, what's left for the president to do? If he's a good president and has a good dean, he can go out and play golf. We went out on a park bench and had a good laugh. But he took this very seriously. He had a hard time convincing the board, but he adopted this position and was lo loyal to the situation. <coughs> and I tried to be loyal. Again, it shows that he was not a selfish man. In those years, they didn't keep a president very long. There were five during my 16 and a half years at Union. He was a good president. We were very close to each other, though he was my senior by many years. He used to talk in chapel about friends being able to explore the realms of silence together. And we could do that. We didn't have to talk all the time. It may be presumptuous of me to claim it, but to me, we seemed kindred spirits, intellectually, spiritually, and theologically. My admiration for him was unbounded, even though we did not agree on everything. <clears throat> More than any president before him, he considered that the faculty, not the president, was the authority on educational matters. Other teachers remember. He felt that faculty meeting was a valuable time, not to be wasted. It was not the place to consider small matters that could just as well be handled by administrative policy, or, excuse me, processes. He was interested in the overall philosophy of instruction and the overall curriculum of the college. <laughs> he made us feel that we were all a team, that he was one of us, simply chairman of the group. Back from fall council, he'd invite interested faculty members to hear a little report about what had gone on, about plans, feelings, what he knew, we knew. We weren't working for him. We were working with him. ML's supervision included what some may have thought to be a purely personal matter. He was very outspoken in regard to a teacher's obligation in relation to his tithe. He checked the church books. He had no place for a non-tithing teacher. M. L.'s Dean recalls, quote, I was always impressed by the humanity of his disciplinary actions. I remember a young man who got himself in serious trouble and denied it for a long time. His father had appealed to Andresen to see whether he couldn't handle this constructively and help him so it wouldn't ruin the boy's reputation for the rest of his life. I, as dean, and he, as president, worked <coughs> on the young man until we finally got him to own up. 
he had to take some sort of punishment. And it was so administered that it wasn't a slap on the wrist, yet it was of such a nature that no one knew about it. Andreasen assured him that he and I would never mention it to anyone, and we never did. <coughs> Sometimes the crime is so public that the punishment has to be. Another boy had done something that, had it been known, he would have been expelled and had, would have been unable to get a job for a long time. My inclination was to be much more tough. But I learned something from Andreasen. He used to say that when a faculty member or a minister or a student went wrong, there ought to be a conspiracy of silence about it. It shouldn't be dragged out. He felt strongly that a man's misdeeds should not be public property unless they were public in the first place. Many deeds are not public. When there was a delicate situation, he didn't hesitate to bypass the preceptors, the regular members of the discipline committee. M.L. himself tells of another of his guiding principles, quote, Some parents and teachers have a custom of saying no to every request unless there are good reasons for granting it. I made up my mind that I would take the opposite view. Instead of saying or thinking, why should this be granted? I would say, why should it not be granted? As I followed this line, I would immediately have the goodwill of the child or the young person, and though at times I was compelled to deny the request, he would still consider me his friend and would come back again for counsel. He knew I would weigh the problem, look at it from his viewpoint, and attempt to help him. End quote. A teacher comments, One of his policies was that when young people came to Union College, the staff should recognize that they were no longer in academy. <laughs> They should be called young men or young women. We were to show we had confidence that they would, at least up to a point, live up to the standard. Of course, that did not eliminate discipline. <clears throat> Those who made infractions were dealt with. Cheating in examinations was completely taboo. Anyone who cheated, ML considered to have failed. We had a few cases where this was um, actually applied. One girl was sent home because she cheated and she never came back. Plenty of students did come to Union to stay, but in the fall of 1935, under the heading Large Enrollment at Union, ML wrote, It is not numbers that count. We are glad that we have as many students as we have, but we are more glad to know that by far the greater majority are here to work and to work hard. We are also glad to be enabled to furnish work for so many. It is the unanimous opinion of the teachers that the students here this year are here for business, that they study harder, and work harder than ever before. This is as much as it should be. Excuse me, this is as it should be. Times certainly do not seem to improve much, and it is the part of wisdom to prepare now for the future. We bespeak for union the prayers of all. During the 1935-36 school year, 18 former students of Union began foreign mission service. This was no accident because Union was known as the College of the Golden Cords. On the front wall of the chapel, 
hung a large picture of the college building from which extended a golden cord for each former student who had gone out as a missionary. The cords were fastened to the plaques on either side of the picture, representing the hemisphere to which they had gone. One Friday morning during chapel, M.L. passed out cards to all students who would be willing to go as foreign missionaries if God should call them. He did no urging. It was just a matter-of-fact presentation of the needs and an opportunity for the students to let it be known they were available. 125 signed the cards. Friday evening, a week later, cords were hung for each of the 18 missionaries who had gone out that year. Then the 125 who had signed the cards solemnly went to the front to offer themselves to foreign missions. Union's work opportunities did not come spontaneously as seen from news notes appearing from time to time during 1934 in the Central Union Reaper. Industries greatly enlarged, the Reaper said. More land rented for farm. <clears throat> Broom shop to be built. Capital City Book Bindery, one of Union's industries, has received large orders from all over the state for thousands of books to be rebound, necessitating addition of four more workers. Union College Dairy this week has bacteria count of 3,000 against usual certified milk figure of 10 to 12,000. Management has been forced to increase barn capacity to accommodate 67 cows. Some 13 students work in the dairy doing milking, breeding, and barn work, bottling milk, making cheese, butter, and ice cream. Union has weathered the financial storm and paid a substantial sum toward debt reduction. Other news notes during the year touch on academic matters. Quote, medical cadet course announced in consultation with General Conference. Dr. Schilling lectures on mysteries of light and electricity. Elder Andreasen asked by General Conference to teach systematic theology in advanced Bible school to be held during six weeks this summer at PUC. On October 31, 1936, a special offering was taken throughout the 25,000 member Central Union to make possible a new library for Union College. Each of the conference presidents wrote an article about it in the Reaper. Andreasen's contribution read, The new library is not an ordinary necessity that somehow we could manage to get along with, with get along without if we do not get it. It is a compelling necessity, one of the things needed for our continuance as a college. It means much. I am impressed to say that it means all to Union College at this time. We believe our people will respond not only liberally, but of their necessity. This project must not and will not fail. Our great Central Union is behind the movement to a man. God is going before us and victory is ahead. Brethren, Pray for Union College, its faculty, and its students. Much depends on the next few years. The new library was built, thus meeting one of the urgent prerequisites for the accreditation of Union College. Next chapter. There are not too many young people you could write a book about one of M.L.'s young women students 
reminisces. Most are just usual people. He was so different. There was never any monotony. ML was well aware that his personal appearance was not impressive. He'd say, I know what you're thinking. What in the world is, the, is that little sawed-off runt doing around here? Despite his short legs, <laughs> he had a quick little prancing step that he was noted for. In spite of, or because of, his unimpressive figure, he had to have his suits tailored just so. He never put a cuff on his pants. That was considered foppish when he began the ministry. ML was a fast driver. On one occasion, he invited the Central Union Conference president to accompany him in his Model A Ford to a meeting both had been uh, were to attend in California. The president thought he would be too slow. So the president thought that would be too slow, so went by rail. When the train stopped in Denver, ML was on the platform. <laughs> when the train arrived in Reno, there was ML. When it reached River Riverside once again, ML was on the platform, waiting to chauffeur the president to the meeting in Loma Linda. ML customarily carried two things with him, a clipboard on which to jot down ideas and a cap folded up in his pocket to protect his head should the weather get a little cool. He claimed he always had a handkerchief in his desk drawer <clears throat> to hand to any girl who might begin to weep when he found it necessary to admonish her. He believed in keeping in touch with everything that was going on around the college. If there was a program of any kind, he was there ahead of time to ensure that everything was in order. His office was right off the steps to the chapel so he could see the students as they went in as well as be there when they were dismissed. ML got a new recorder for the speech department. Once, when he had to be away for chapel, he conceived the idea of recording his speech and having it played. This was very much of a novelty in those days, before tape recorders became widespread. Here I am, traveling over the roads in Oklahoma and talking to you in the chapel, he, he spoke. On the top of a blackboard in one of the main halls was a section about 9 by 25 inches where ML would keep a small quotation. Each week he'd have his secretary copy a new one, which the students always looked for. Upon occasion, ML used with effect the expression, and that's not good, said through his nose. If a student requested something he could see no light in, he merely would say no and maintain an utterly noncommittal expression on his face until the suppliant finally gave up. If you, have a, if you asked him a question, he might sit for a minute before he answered, one student recalls. It wouldn't help to pester him. You just asked the question and waited. He'd start talking about it soon. Others remember, I used to marvel at the chapel talks he'd give every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday he was in town. The talks were short, 20 to 30 minutes. They included a wealth of information. He had no end of material. He was a dynamic speaker, and yet he just talked. It was different. Everyone loved to hear him. Once at a camp meeting, ML was given the one o'clock hour. He began, quote, I feel sorry for God. After that, no one slept. 
At first, hearers would notice ML's short sentences, his lack of resonance, and his straightforward presentation, but soon they became accustomed to that and began to realize that he spoke prose poetry with a slight accent. ML had a very simple way of maintaining standards. He would stick his tongue behind his teeth and say, that is not done at Union. That settled everything. At Hutchinson, he had tried as far as possible to dramatize Bible text. Sometimes he would have students dress up to show how persons in other countries dressed and acted. The students were impressed but when he was at Union, he was criticized by some leaders for doing this. After ML became president of Union College, association between men and women students was considered liberalized. One student recalls his fiancée's being reprimanded because she had been escorted the mile and a half down the boulevard to the home where she was employed. ML called the young man in to get the details. To the youth's amazement, ML left the impression that he seemed to think it was kind of nice that a fellow didn't want his girlfriend out alone after dark. Of course, ML wasn't always that lenient. I expect that in his younger days he was one of those very stern, unbending Adventists, one of M.L.'s acquaintances said. I think it was later that he developed his tolerance and sense of understanding of the importance of other people. People are more important than rules. One of the teachers had on his necktie a little pin from the university where he had gotten his Ph.D. M.L. said, The field would criticize you for that. The teacher knew it was he. One year, there was a long discussion <clears throat> about whether the teachers should wear regalia at graduation. When the vote was taken, the majority was in favor. M.L. said, I veto that. He had done enough work in English for his Ph.D., according to one associate, but did not take his exams. Toward the end of his life, M.L. said that if he had to do it over again, he would finish his doctorate. Not that it would have changed his work one iota, but it would have removed any excuse for younger men to minimize his scholarship. And I think we'll stop there for now. Okay, let's close with prayer, shall we? Father, we are thankful that even though we don't carry the name of the denomination, we have your word, we have the spirit of prophecy to hold close to our hearts, in practice, we we appreciate what you have done for the during, especially during the first fifty years of the formation of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and we hold fast to those pillars of truth. And we ask now that you will bless each one who's joined us, that you will uh, give us of your Spirit, protect us through the coming days until we meet again, which may be tomorrow morning or Wednesday evening or Thursday evening, I don't know. But at least we pray all of us can be gathered together for Sabbath. And until that end, may your spirit uh, live in our hearts and guide us, and may we be totally surrendered to your will for our lives. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, until we meet again, may God bless and keep you. Bye for now.